Today, we are taking a look at Sony's latest addition to their cinema line of cameras. This is the Burano, a full-frame 8K cinema camera aimed to sit somewhere between the FX9 and the Venice. It shares a bunch with both cameras, but also has some pretty unique features. So sit down, get comfy, and let's get into this really intriguing new camera. The camera we have with us today is a pre-production loan unit from Sony, which they have been kind enough to lend us for a couple of days just before the announcement. The Burano has been designed to fill the gap between the FX9 and Venice. For people who want image quality closer to the Venice, but want the flexibility and design of a camera more tailored for run and gun and documentary filmmaking. This is precisely how it behaves when we took it out to film briefly over the weekend. We've tried to shoot as much example footage, tests, and learn as much about the camera as we could in the short time that we had it for this video. But if you have any more questions, please let us know down below. The Burano has a new full frame 8.6K Exmor RS stat sensor from Sony, but it does share a lot of its key specs with the 8.6K sensor that you can get for the Venice 2. It has a physical size of 3.59 by 23.962 millimeters, but unlike the Venice 2, which can shoot 3x2 open gate, the Burano is limited to a 16x9 or 17x9 crop, which uses roughly 35.9 by 20.2 millimeters or 8,632 by 4,856 worth of the sensor in its 16x9 mode. It weirdly uses less in its 17x9 mode. It has a dual base ISO of 800 and 3200, which is the same as the Venice 2 8K sensor block, and is rated to capture 16 plus stops of dynamic range. And from our testing, it does perform very well in this regard. How much of the sensor is being used will depend on what scan mode and recording format you are in. But some will crop in while others will downsample. But there is no line skipping or pixel binning in any of the modes. Honestly, I didn't expect this camera to be 8K. I thought it would be based around the 6K Venice sensor. And I really do think that 6K is the current sweet spot for a lot of productions. Luckily, Sony has added a very confusingly named FF Crop 6K mode, which takes roughly 8K's worth of the sensor and oversamples it to 6K. Somehow this is even still possible in Exocian LT, which is good, but I'm not sure how Sony have done this. If they let me know, I'll make sure that it's in the pinned comment below. This is great, as it means you have the flexibility to either shoot a slightly wider field of view 8.6K frame if you want as much resolution as possible, or this more manageable crop 6K, which is very close in field of view to the 8K. When it comes to recording formats, you have a few options to choose from. Exocian LT is Sony's most compressed flavor of Exocian RAW, and it's really exciting to have this in this type of camera. Exocian offers 16-bit linear encoding, which compared with how much color this camera can see, allows you to capture really deep digital negatives. The Venice cameras can shoot less compressed versions of Exocian, but that's not surprising given that Venice is Sony's flagship cinema camera. For most users this camera is aimed at, LT will be more than enough to still capture great looking images that are flexible in post without being too much to handle. You can shoot Exocian in a range of different scan modes, which you can see here. Up next is a couple of new XAVC variants that use H.265 compression, which compared to H.264 flavors of XAVC is approximately twice as efficient. This allows you to record 8K XAVC. There are three different versions in the camera, XAVC HIHQ or high quality, HISQ or mid quality, and then HL or light, which is a long GOP variant. These are all 422 10-bit, but are capturing different data rates. All of the XAVC in the camera uses the MXF wrapper over MP4, which was used with the Alpha One's 8K H.265 recording. This keeps it much more in line with the existing standard that Sony cameras like this have used for a while now. Lastly, you have the option to shoot regular XAVC-I when you don't want to record in 8K. You can capture up to DCI 4K and down to Full HD in this mode while still downsampling when choosing the scan modes with greater resolution, which is awesome. Sony has done a really great job of providing a really nice mix of different modes and formats to cover the exact requirements that you may need for your production. Looking at our resolution chart, we can see the camera's OLPF does a good job at reducing moiré, but you can still see a touch of it on our higher number line pair circles here. 
During the rest of our shooting though, we didn't actually notice much of it, which is really good. As we mentioned earlier, the Burano has a dual base ISO of 800 and 3200 in S-Log3, which is really useful for a camera that is aimed to be versatile and adaptable for different lighting conditions. You don't have any of the Cine EI quick modes that some of the FX cameras have now, just custom and Cine EI. And when you want to switch bases, you need to do so manually. This can be assigned to a button, so it can be quick to do, but I would like to see Sony introduce the other shooting modes to this camera, as I think it needs them. Noise is very close between the two bases, which is great to see. You can control noise suppression levels in both Cine EI or custom modes. This is similar to what is possible with the FX6, and something that's not possible with the Venice 2. When toggling between off and the three strengths, we can see a clear difference in noise. This is even still possible when shooting an Exocian LT, as well as the various XAVC options. This is awesome, as the noise reduction looks pretty good from our testing, and can be really helpful when you want a slightly cleaner image straight out of the camera. You will obviously lose a little bit of detail, but that's always the balance you need to find with noise reduction, and being able to do this in camera while shooting RAW is going to be very helpful. For our latitude test, we thought we would take a look at how the Burano compares to some other cameras at its price point and some others in the Sony lineup. So we grabbed an FX6, FX9 and Venice 2 with the 8.6K module and a Red V Raptor, as they are similarly priced. We used our trusty Zeiss Otis 55mm and used an E to EF Metabones for the Sony cameras and a Canon RF to EF on the V Raptor. Here's a breakdown of our methodology. And one thing to bear in mind is that these results have no noise reduction applied. So some of these clips can clean up nicely with a bit of work in post or by setting some noise reduction in camera. Anyway, let's take a look at the results. For overexposure, we can see that the Burano holds everything well until four stops over, where we can see white on our color chart starting to clip and Sam's skin starting to break. At five stops over, Sam's skin really starts to clip and some of the colors on our chart start clipping too. At five and two thirds, we can start to see the blue chip clipping as well. When compared to Venice 2, performance is almost identical across the range. The FX9 also performs similarly to the previous two cameras, and the FX6 is maybe a touch worse than the FX9 here. The V-Raptor seems to clip a little quicker on Sam's skin, but performs well on the chart at four stops over, and this holds true all the way up to six stops. Looking at underexposure, we can see that the Burano performs really well, even down to minus four, noise is handled very well. As we hit minus five and six though, it does get very noisy. However, color is held onto incredibly well given how underexposed we are. I also got a take at minus six with the same exposure settings apart from the ISO, which was set to its second base of 3200. This is a good visualization on why this second base is so helpful. I would say that the Venice 2 holds onto color and detail better than the Burano, but the Burano looks better at the low exposures. Compared to the FX9, the Burano looks much cleaner, with less blocky noise and a far more usable image towards six stops under. The FX6 looks better than the FX9, but still doesn't compare to what the Burano sees. The noise again looks chunkier, which will come down to the difference in the resolution. I think the V-Raptor performs well here, with better tone compared to the Burano, but both are pretty usable towards the darker stops. Overall, I'm really impressed with how the Burano performs, and anyone currently using an FX6 or FX9 Wondering if there is a difference between them and the Burano, I hope these tests show just how much of a difference there is and how close the image is to Venice 2. The Burano features a slow and quick mode, which is very similar to the previous systems found in Sony cameras. You can go into this mode and dial your frame rate all the way down to one or up to the max possible in your given recording format. You can capture 8.6K 17x9 up to 30p, 6K 17x9 with that slight crop that we talked about, or 5.8K 17x9 in a Super 35 crop mode up to 60, and Super 35 crop 4K 17x9 up to 120 frames per second, all in XOCN LT or XAVC. The 6K crop mode is so close to the field of view of full frame that I think for most, this will be the format that the camera lives in. Overall, it's a pretty solid set of frame rates, but I do think that it would have been good to get a little bit more, which run and gun filmmakers would have appreciated. The high frame rate footage itself looks really good, which is in part thanks to the no line skipping or pixel binning in any of these modes. The Burano is the first camera in its class to ever feature a stabilized sensor. Not even the FX6 or FX9 have a stabilized sensor, so this certainly is an interesting addition to a camera that's more expensive and aimed at slightly higher end users than those systems. 
With a Sony E-mount lens attached, you can get up to five stops of stabilizing power, and it looks pretty good. You can see some wobbly corners at points, but overall it performs really well, and will certainly be helpful in a lot of cases. This system even allows you to enable it when using fully manual lenses, which will be awesome when running PL mount lenses or Cook's new SP3 primes on this camera, which is what we did. For this, you will need to dial the focal length of your lens into the camera, as it won't be able to tell electronically like it can with standard E-mount lenses. And it really does need you to do this to adjust the stabilization to perform the best it can. The camera also has an active mode, which is more tailored for video and aims to optimize the five axis image stabilization for handheld shooting. Unfortunately, it is limited to only a few select modes in the camera because it needs to crop in to execute this extra stabilization. But for some, the extra stabilization power could be worth the crop. Brano features an up-to-date version of Sony's autofocus system and it performs excellently from our testing using it. It has the same limb recognition AI that was introduced into the A7R5 originally. And this makes it really good at recognizing human subjects even when it doesn't detect a face in the frame. It really does do a good job of recognizing a subject and keeping focus. And it will even track eyes when a face is large enough in your frame. This paired with the other quality of life improvements will make this camera very interesting for running gun filmmakers and operators. You can control a few different parameters of the system in the menu, and if you've used an FX6 or FX9, you'll feel right at home here. You can control the transition speed, slower looking a bit more like a natural focus pull and fast when you just want it to snap onto your focus point or subject. You can also control how sensitive it is to shift subjects and then a range of pretty normal focusing tweaks. If you have these set wrong, you may not be happy with the performance. Once you understand how these parameters behave, the autofocus really can be excellent on this, as well as Sony's other cinema line cameras. The monitor is touchscreen as well, so you can easily just tap to focus if you need to, which is pretty handy. The Burano features an internal variable ND system, which is very similar to the one found in the FX6 and FX9, but has been reworked slightly. When toggling it from clear, it goes straight to 0.6 ND, no 0.3, which is a shame, but this is the same as the system on the FX6 and FX9, which also caps out at 2.1. You can enable Auto ND, which is awesome for run and gun or documentary filmmakers going between changing lighting conditions, as it does it very smoothly. You can control this in the auto exposure menu. We wanted to test the color shift as well as IR pollution with the NDs, so let's start looking at our color shift test first. For these, we lit our gray card evenly in the center of frame. We exposed the ND with the lens pretty much wide open and then closed down the lens as we decreased the ND. We did this a stop at a time until we finished with the camera set to clear. Unsurprisingly, as you increase the ND intensity, there is a slight shift in Kelvin. With tint, once you enable the ND, there is only a very, very minor shift. There isn't a massive variance here, and it's something that will be easily correctable if you shoot RAW. However, if you shoot XAVC, it's definitely still worth white balancing when you first enable the NDs at least. For our IR pollution test, we grabbed an Ari Blonde and a bunch of different black materials for our scene. When we take a look at our clear, we can see that our black materials here do look a touch purple compared to the color that they should be. When we toggle the ND, we can see a slight increase in the purple in our blacks, and this holds true to the deeper ND strengths, which do look worse, but this could also be because of the increase in noise as we hit our aperture limit quite quickly. Sony has done a really good job of putting fast full frame sensors in their video cameras as of late, and I'm happy to say that the Burano also has a really fast readout time. We wanted to see how it compared to the Venice 2's insanely fast 8K sensor, and it is close, but not quite as fast as it. For most scenarios though, its performance will be more than enough to keep things looking pretty normal and not all wobbly. The Brano's color science has been tuned to look closer to the Venice than the FX9. You can shoot the regular mix of color spaces, gammas, and profiles, as you'd expect from a Cine Alta Sony camera. This includes S-Log3 S-Gamma3 dot Cine, which would be the go-to for people wanting to get the absolute most out of this camera as they can. Pretty much every modern Sony camera has this now, so they are decently easy to match, and color pipelines in post are well established for this. It also has S709, which would be great for shooting faster turnaround images. The Brano also has a few new color looks. This consists of a warm, cool, vintage, and teal and orange preset. The Brano system comes with both E and PL mount as standard, the PL mount sits over the top of the E-mount, attaching via these screws. This PL mount has contacts with both Cook iData and extended lens data, but no LDS. 
On the Venice 1, these screws were not captive. With the Burano and the Venice 2 though, Sony has made these captive, which is a massive improvement. I cannot tell you how fantastic this is to see, as someone who has nearly lost the mount screws on more than one occasion. This will make switching to an E-mount lens or an adapter or to Kipatai's LPL mount so much less stressful. This system feels very robust and makes the Burano incredibly versatile as you can adapt so many lenses via the E-mount or if you want to, stick to PL or LPL for traditional cinema lenses. Given the camera's autofocus performance and the vast array of great Sony E-mount lenses, I can really see the E-mount on this camera being used a lot. It will make for some very lightweight configurations. There are a bunch of E-mount adapters as well, as specific Venice mount ones such as Leitz's M-mount and Kipatai's LPL mount. The E-mount is a locking one, and this can be a bit fiddly if you're a solo operator to get lenses on and off, but after time, you will get used to it. I can see E-mount lenses being used a good bit with Burano, so it's great to see that Sony have a good range of options for controlling how lenses behave while on camera. This includes a range of compensation modes, including breathing with compatible lenses. The Burano is on our lens coverage and camera comparison tool. So if you want to see how your lenses cover the different sensor modes, head over to it via the link in the description below. Unfortunately, the Burano doesn't have the false color tool that is present in the Venice. This is a shame, as it is a really useful tool to have. When it comes to exposure tools, you can cycle through having a waveform, vector scope, or histogram on your screen, or you can use the great Zebra tool. If you've used the Zebra tool on any of Sony's other cinema line cameras, you'll be right at home here. You can really dial in the exact percent you want, which is good for exposing for middle gray on a color chart, which we do very often. The Burano has a dual CF Express Type B card slot, which is awesome to see. Sony will be releasing their own CF Express Type B cards, which will be available in one and two terabyte variants. These will be guaranteed to work 100% with the Burano. And you'll also be able to recover data via Sony with their in-house restoration service. Third-party cards will work though, which is pretty amazing as CF Express Type B is a really fast and affordable media type with loads of options available for it now. We used two of the Angelbird and Lexar cards that we had in-house with the camera and they worked fine but we mainly use Sony's two terabyte card when out on location. This dual card slot allows you to simultaneously record to both cards, which for the market this camera is aimed at will be an excellent feature. For this to work though, you will need to be using two cards of the same size. You will also be able to use it to record proxies. I'm really glad that Sony used type B rather than their own proprietary media type, but I do think some Venice owners may feel a bit hard done by considering just how expensive AXS cards are. When you get the footage into post from the Burano, it can be really nice to process if you understand a few little things. For many people grabbing this camera, it may be their first time using XOCN. And the 8K XOCN really does need to be on some fast drives if you want to play it back well. XOCN ingests into Resolve a bit weird as well. Each clip has its own folder, so you have to select them all and then add them into your project together. Once in Resolve though, you can then adjust the regular parameters you would expect for a raw format. XAVCI is pretty standard and will play back and edit well across most major NLEs. However, the H.265 compressed 8K can be hard to play back if you don't have a computer that can decode H.265. We use Mac Studios and MacBooks as our primary editing machines, so performance for us was excellent. But if you are using a non M series processor MacBook or Windows machine, you may run into some issues. With the camera being more aimed towards run and gun solo operators, it's unsurprising to see comprehensive audio control and integration into the camera. It features two full-size XLR inputs with solid quality preamps so you can roll audio straight into your recordings. You have controls for both channels on the left-hand side of the body and can change some settings in the menu too, where you can choose what channels three and four are also doing. It also has a scratch mic built in, which could be helpful. You can toggle between line and mic level as well as mic with phantom power on the right hand side of the camera. I like the position of the XLRs, they are angled really nicely to have cables come out cleanly. The dials for gain are in a nice position for shoulder operation, which I can see this camera being used a good bit in. On the top of the camera, there's this little cover here that we didn't open, but Sony has confirmed that this reveals the port that can be found on the top of the FX9. So you can actually use the top handle from that. This is pretty cool, as it adds all of the functionality that the handle has, including audio accessories that use the MI shoe, like Sony's wireless audio system to get more feeds into the camera. 
The menu is a mishmash of different camera systems, but will feel familiar if you've used the FX6, 9 or Venice. As with the Venice, it features a dual layer design. If you tap the menu button, it will bring up the quick menu, and you can then swipe through the different pages and control what you need to. To get into the full menu, you have to hold down the menu button. This system is very familiar to the FX cameras. You can create your own user menu, which makes getting to all of the settings you change a lot much faster. There's a lot here, and I don't want to go over all of it, but there are a few things worth mentioning. First off, the camera has an auto exposure mode, which I really didn't expect to see. But given its run and gun design, I guess it does make sense. The white balance system is similar to the ones in the FX6 and 9, which means you can't select the exact portion of your frame like you can with smaller FX cameras, which makes using a grey card on location really annoying. I would love to see Sony change this to make this process much more accurate and easier across all their cameras that currently have this system. You can ingest your own LUTs into the camera, which you can toggle between monitoring and burning straight into your clips. There are some limitations here when it comes to outputting them via the different video feeds compared to something like the Venice, but I think that's fine given the difference in users that this is aimed at. It currently only has de-squeeze options for 1.3 and 2 times anamorphic lenses, so I'm hoping that Sony adds more soon to cover more options. If you hit the home button on the monitor, you can bring up this nice secondary operation page. This emulates the side screen that can be found on the Venice's AC side. And this could be good if you have an external monitor on the camera and want to control the camera this way or have it mounted onto the other side of the camera for an AC to operate with. The camera is really fast. Switching between formats is pretty quick, though some do require a restart which does take a little bit of time. The camera also boots really quickly at roughly 2 seconds. The magnify tool on the Burano is excellent. You can punch in a good amount, it's clear, and you can do it while recording, which is fantastic. The Burano features an interval recording mode, which will allow you to create some great looking time lapses. It also has a pre-record function, which will be incredibly handy when shooting unpredictable subjects like wildlife. You can do this in every scan mode and format, but how long of a cache you get before you hit record will depend on which combination of this you choose. I've created this table of a few of the key combinations, but this isn't everything. When Sony release their manual, I'll make sure there's a link to it in the pinned comment as this should have the full data for this. Comparing some of the data we have to Venice 2, it doesn't have as big of a cache across all the modes that they share that we have. The camera has the same grey finish as the rest of Sony's cinema line. Its build quality is far more like the FX9 though than it is the Venice. It doesn't feel quite as tanky as the Venice, but that's not surprising given that the Venice is made out of metal, whereas this isn't. The camera kind of looks like you've asked an AI to merge the FX6 and Venice together. Or simply put, a Venice designed for solo operation over crew base. It's around a kilogram heavier than the FX9 and around a kilogram lighter than the Venice. It's decently compact for a camera of its spec. Anyway, let's take a look around the camera to see what's going on. On the front, you have four screws which are similar to the ones used on the Venice for removing the sensor block but that is currently not possible with this camera. You then have one of the 11 assignable buttons, which you can reassign in the menu to loads of different functions. And of course, the removable PL mount we mentioned earlier. On the top, you have a few different mounting points, so you can get the included top handle on in a few different orientations, as well as any extras you need to mount. The top handle feels nice in the hand, though one thing I wish they would have done is to make the screws captive for this. It doesn't have any control on the handle at all, but like I said earlier, you can use the FX9 handle if you want to change that. You then have some cable management and a tape hook for measuring your marks. The rest of the monitor viewfinder assembly looks similar to FX series cameras, but has seen major design improvements to improve how robust it is. It all mounts via a 15mm bar, which you can adjust via this awkwardly placed screw. You then have an arm which allows you to attach the new monitor. This can be adjusted pretty freely, and it does feel much more solid than the previous systems like this from Sony. It comes with a loop which you can attach to use the monitor as a viewfinder. And I think Sony really could have done better here. When I first saw it, I was instantly reminded of the L350 for the F55. The mounting system to get the loop onto the monitor is really nice. It's a serious upgrade from the FX cameras, but the new loop itself is massive and requires you to reposition the monitor to mount the loop into the correct orientation to be used as a viewfinder. This means that you can't just swing the loop up if you want to use the monitor in the normal orientation and then back down when you need it to be a viewfinder again. For running gun operators, this will be incredibly annoying and I really hope someone figures out some kind of mod or product 
that you can replace this loop with. So you don't have to reposition the monitor every time you want to switch between the two. The monitor itself is really nice. It's clear, feels well built, it's touchscreen, has a good range of buttons and is easily positionable. But it's not the brightest, so it's hard to see in brighter conditions. It also uses the same connector as the FX6 and 9. It's a real shame that you can't use the fantastic EL200 with this camera. I think if Sony created a viewfinder positioned below the EL200 that was compatible with the FX cameras and the Burano, a lot of people would grab one. The Burano weirdly doesn't come with a 15mm mic mount, whereas the FX9 does. So if you want to run a top mic, it's worth grabbing one when you buy the camera. On the bottom, you have a similar layout of threads to Venice 2. This paired with the same optical height as Venice 2 means that you can use Venice 2 base plates with the Burano. There are two sets of vents here for the cooling system and a tally light, which is a really cool position for one. As with Sony's other cameras, on the left side is where the bulk of the physical controls are. Starting at the top, you have a hold button, which locks off all side control of the camera. On the far right, you have the clips button, which allows you to enter playback mode. Next is an AF-MF switch. You then have the ND control cluster. This allows you to enable the ND as well as switch between controlling it in steps or in its variable mode. You then have two of the assignable buttons, a display button for toggling through the different monitor display modes and the joystick for controlling the menu or other movable things like a focus position or magnifier. You then have the main control dial, a nice large record button that lights up red when you start rolling. You then have the menu button and a back button and then a range of audio controls for channels one and two. There are two switches to auto gain and dials for controlling the game precisely here. Next is the card slot behind a nice solid feeling door. Below that you have a slot select button for switching between the two card slots. You then have a nice solid power switch, a utility SD card slot and a headphone out port. It's really nicely laid out and feels good to operate on the shoulder or handheld. On the right you have two full size XLR inputs and switches for controlling them as well. On this same section, you have a USB-C port, which can be used for a range of things. Above that, you have another assignable button and a witness mark. Below that, we have a rosette, which is mainly there for the optional grip arm from Sony, but could be used with anything you want that uses a standard rosette. This new control arm is really great, and if you plan to use the camera on the shoulder at all, it's definitely worth grabbing. It connects via 2.5mm lank here and allows you to control loads of the camera settings. The arm itself has been reworked over previous versions. It feels much more robust and it's easy to adjust thanks to this little quick release system here. It's really nice. Joe really enjoyed operating the camera in what he coined minigun mode. Next to the grip input, you have a remote input. You then have another cutout for the cooling system. Next is the connector for the viewfinder, a tally light that sits just behind it, and markings for your range of inputs and outputs. This design is far more similar to the FX9 than the Venice. It's not been designed for AC operation, whereas the Venice clearly has been. On the back of the camera, you have an integrated V-Lock plate for powering the camera via your regular 12 volt batteries. The camera has a max power draw of roughly 50 watts, so you should get pretty good battery life from it. One thing to note here is that there are no power outputs on the camera at all. So if you want to power anything like a lens servo, wireless video system or monitor, you'll need to get some kind of power distro onto the camera. This will most likely be via a V to V mount plate that will give you some output options. With how short the camera is, this might not be a bad thing for certain configurations and lenses when on your shoulder. You then have the camera's range of inputs and outputs. You have a HDMI that can output 4K, SDI1, which is capable of outputting 12G, and SDI2, which is a standard 3G SDI. How these behave depends on what recording mode you are in, and they can be independent, but in XOCN, they are limited to mirror a 3G output. Next, you have a timecode BNC and ref out BNC, and then an ethernet port. Lastly, you have a standard four pin XLR for powering the camera from a remote power supply, such as a block battery. Sony have got a really comprehensive set of cameras across their cinema line now. As we've said, the Burano sits between the FX9 and the Venice, and it's priced accordingly for that as well. I know that there have been plenty of owner operators and documentary shooters who have wanted an FX9 that has an image closer to that of the Venice. And I think the Burano delivers exactly that. Its image is close to the Venice, but you have all of the creature comforts that you would expect from an FX series camera. There are clear differences between the three of them that will make them better or worse for a given shooter or production. The FX6 and FX9 are still great options for run and gun broadcast work, but are limited to internally compressed XABC and compromised image quality. 
The Venice is Sony's flagship no compromise cinema camera. It has the most flexible image and recording formats, but is expensive to kit out and lends itself far more to crew operation. The Burano combines the image and the raw flexibility of the Venice and the usability features of the FX cameras. But if you want some advice on what may be best for you and some help designing your perfect rig, get in contact with our experienced technical team today. Details about that are in the description below. The Sony Burano is a camera that we've been asking for, a replacement to the F55. And I think it does it well. It has excellent image quality, flexible recording formats with good raw options, fantastic autofocus, helpful image stabilization, Sony's excellent electronic variable ND system, all in a well-built body with loads of control. Being able to create light packages you can run using E-mount lenses while capturing images of this quality and flexibility is fantastic. I should attract many people wanting Venice image quality at a lower price point. I just wish that Sony had handled the viewfinder side of this slightly better. The loop on the included monitor is pretty bad, and I honestly think that many people will just replace it as soon as a better option becomes available. Sony needs to make an optional viewfinder for the FX cameras and this, or maybe a converter for the excellent EL200, though that is a pretty expensive viewfinder for these cameras. Fingers crossed, this is something that Sony can develop as this camera truly does deserve it. Also, if you're wondering why it's called Burano, it's because Burano is an island roughly 11 kilometers from Venice, and Sony wanted to keep with the Italian theme. Let us know what you think of the camera, and if you have any other further questions down in the comments below. Like I said, we didn't have the camera for long, so hopefully we'll get it back in for more testing soon. Anyway, if you like the video, please give it a like, and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.